Galileo in Scripture uh, is one of the major uh, controversial points that's brought up. Um, and uh, sometimes we don't pay enough attention to it, and so today I'm trying to see if I can change that a little. Um, <coughs> as most of you know by now, Copernicus made it the proposal that the Earth turned on its axis and moved around the sun, which was fixed in space as were the stars. And um, this was um, uh, the first time that it had been really uh, popularly looked at, uh, or at least uh, in the scholarly world, uh, since uh, uh, since at least the time of Christ and before. It, in fact, had previously been uh, proposed by the Pythagoreans. Um, and uh, for that reason, you'll find if you read some of the literature of the, of the era, it called the Pythagorean heresy. Um, Galileo supported Copernicus's theory, and the way he supported it was primarily by um, observations that Copernicus could not make, uh, particularly uh, observations of Jupiter's moons, which suggested that uh, the Earth wasn't the center of everything. Um, and that some things that were not visible to the naked eye on Earth could still be, in fact, out there. Mountains on the moon, sunspots, both of which indicated, um, if you want to call it that, imperfections in uh, um, certainly implying that the moon was not totally smooth. Uh, interestingly, now that we have uh, accepted that, it's pretty easy for us to see it with the naked eye, but uh, such is the power of suggestion that uh, mountains on the moon were not definitively seen. Uh, in, even irregularities were discounted uh, until the time of Galileo. And finally, the most important one is the phases of Venus, which were predicted by the enemies of Copernicus. And uh, Copernicus says, I don't know what will happen, but uh, then, uh, uh, you know, God in his own good time will take care of that. And uh, with the telescope of uh, Galileo, the phases were clearly seen, which is really kind of a death blow to the idea. Certainly, <coughs> Venus orbits the sun and not the Earth, even if you have the sun orbiting the Earth. Uh, which was kind of the last ditch gasp of the uh, uh, of the uh, theory of uh, of Ptolemy was that well it's really the the sun still circles the earth the earth doesn't move and this, and the other uh, planets circle the sun. One of the accusations against Galileo was that his theory was against the plain meaning of Scripture. And it was a powerful accusation at the time. If it could be made to stick, Galileo was hung. And in fact, um, one of the two heresies of Galileo, according to Mar Maurice Finocciaro, who is a historian of the era, was the, quote, methodological principle that the Bible was not a scientific authority. I suspect that most of us in this room are a little uncomfortable with that uh, way of putting things. Um, uh, Genesis would therefore tell us nothing about science, and uh, I'm, we certainly wouldn't want to go with the heresy that Galileo confessed to, I don't think. Um, although there is a, a, another position that uh, was first uh, uh, spoken by Cesare Baro Baronio, and uh, he apparently told it to Galileo, who told it to a number of other people, that the Bible teaches us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. And there's a certain rationale for that. Uh, if you want to repair your car, probably the Bible isn't the first uh, textbook that you want to pick up to try to find out how. 
Now, as we mentioned last week, the Galileo Affair was extremely hard on church authority. It's not just that um, the church is afraid it might make another mistake. The uh, church is also afraid that uh, any discussion of the facts will bring up the point that the church has already made a mistake and put the full weight of papal authority behind it. Um, but what is, what about scripture itself, which is of course the Protestant authority? Now, Protestants have, uh, if I can put it that way, um, basically, I think it's fair to say they have three beliefs that are core. Number one is sola scriptura, scripture alone. Number two is sola fide, sola gratia, is only by faith and only by grace. Um, that we can't earn our way to heaven. Can't earn little pieces of our way to heaven. And that the saints certainly don't have storehouses of merit that can be then transferred to somebody else because all of our merit comes from God alone, even the good works that we do. And finally, there's the priesthood of all believers. And this is really important because if you don't have a priest telling you what to do, well, then how do you find the truth? And the answer that the reformers would give is, you can find out from the Bible yourself. And that requires two things. One of them is the sufficiency of scripture. Scripture has to be good enough to tell us what we need to know. But more importantly, there's the uh, perspicuity of scripture. That is to say, scripture is sufficiently clear to be understood by anybody, you don't have to be a priest. You don't have to study for decades and decades in order to understand what scripture has to say to you. And the fact of the matter is, otherwise you have what's effectively a salvation by intelligence or perhaps by scholarship. And that's anathema to the standard Protestant view of salvation. Now, this perspective leads me to question, as I did a couple weeks ago, the idea that the days of creation are going to be long periods of time, because if you read them just the way they are, it sure sounds like days of 24 hours. Um, if somebody were to argue that 24.2 hours I'm not sure I could make a good case against it. But, but they're you know, evening, morning days. They're days that the sun goes down, there's a night, the sun comes up, there's a day. Um, they're days of what we would now call rotation of the earth. And it seems like any argument that they're days of announcement or days of something else, at least strains, if not violates, the principle of the uh, perspicuity of Scripture. And that's one of the reasons that I, that I, uh, I think I made the point uh, that we're better off accepting the days and then if we don't like them, challenging them, rather than trying to pretend that the text didn't talk about that. Um, but that also means that I have to take seriously people who claim that the firmament is really a hard dome uh, because unless one can show that that in fact doesn't come from the text, then you really do have to accept that as what the Bible is teaching because the perspicuity of uh, perspicuity, I'm going to get that word wrong a couple more times, uh, of scripture is in fact saying that if you read it, you should be able to figure out what it is without having to have a degree. 
So that means that the firmament is, in fact, a, a challenge for us, and we have to meet it head on, which is what I'm trying to do. Yes. But that's the very point that bothers me. I've read that many times, and it has never occurred to me that it has to be a hard no. Well, I think that I think we're going to get into that, and hopefully, when we do, we'll have our uh, friends uh, there to to criticize. So I'll have something to pre prepare that they can criticize instead of having them have something to prepare that I then criticize. Right. We'll, we'll see how that goes, uh, whether we can arrange that or not. But uh, uh, part of this gets into the authority of Scripture. And uh, when I say the authority of Scripture, I'm, I'm not talking about that, that uh, we all respect it. That's what I would call reputed authority, when everybody thinks it is one. I'm talking about an actual authority. Does scripture have that kind of authority? If it does, it has to be able to stand in the face of both uncertainty and of contradiction. That is, if you have an authority, let's say you have a map and it's supposed to be authoritative, then if you don't know where you should be going, which street you should take to get to a certain destination, you should be able to look at the map and the map says you should take a um, narrow way instead of broad street. And, uh, and you look at the map and you say, if the map says that, then I'm going to go on narrow way. Um, and in fact, if you have somebody saying, Broad Street is the way to get to your destination, and the map says narrow way, then if the map has a more authority than the other guy, then you go a narrow way. And that's, that's the point of having an authority, is to be able to stand where you don't know where you should be going and where you have conflicting voices and you're trying to sort out which of them is actually true, uh, which one you should follow, and you take the authority of scripture because it has, in fact, that kind of authority. But that, of course, is a two-edged sword. Um, where reputed authority disagrees with other beliefs of ours, um, perhaps another reputed authority. We have to decide to act on what the reputed authority says or else deny its actual authority. So if you ca come to a place where the standard reading, let's say, of uh, the Bible conflicts with the standard reading of um, maybe the Quran, you have to decide which one is more authoritative because that's the one you're going to follow. And uh, it's important to understand that an authority may be an actual authority in some areas but not in others. To get back to our map, Perhaps our map has no showing of what kinds of territory you're going through, whether it's wooded, whether it's, uh, um, or perhaps it shows a park without noting that there are woods all around the park too. Because its intent is to show the park, not, uh, not, the, uh, not the woodlands. Um, and so it's possible for something to be an authority in one area and not an authority in others. And uh, if you have some person, some experience, some document that is not an authority in this particular area, then it's kind of foolish to rely on it to tell you what's going on. If you find out that the person who made the map really didn't care about woods, then if you try to look at the map carefully to find out where the woods are, that's wasted effort. On the other hand, if it was intended to show where woods are, then uh, if it's accurate, it's a good idea to depend on it. A reputed authority can lose its authority in one of two ways. 
Number one is, of course, being proved wrong. And once it's been proved wrong once, you kind of hesitate to use it anywhere else. Certainly you hesitate to use it in very similar situations because it was wrong. But the second problem with an authority is what's uh, been called by uh, Anthony Flew in his atheist days, the death of a thousand qualifications. That is to say, you depend on the authority and then somebody says, no, 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 you shouldn't depend on it here. No, no, you shouldn't depend on it there. No, no, you shouldn't depend on it there. Eventually it gets to the point where you don't depend on it anywhere. Now, standing up can be the death of an, of an authority, yes. Making a claim, but not standing up guarantees eventual death because there's no content to the authority. And if we're trying to protect biblical authority, we have to be able to stand up in some areas as well as to recognize those areas where the Bible isn't making any special claims and where perhaps we shouldn't uh, use it as a guide. Uh, my example of uh, automobile repair, uh, the Bible isn't uh, the first thing you reach for. Oh, I suppose there are some things about honesty and so forth that kind of apply, but certainly uh, you wouldn't know how to fix a fuel injector or carburetor or, uh, or uh, a cylinder head by looking at what the Bible has to say about it because it's simply not geared for that kind of, of uh, information. Well, I'm, I'm going to go over now with that background, Galileo and scriptures, and I'm going to ask two quest three questions, well, one of which I'm going to give an answer to, and I think it's the answer that most of us would agree with. What do the scriptures actual, actually say? And this is going to be interesting because I found out some things when I was studying that uh, I was rather surprised uh, by. Uh, number two, it's a question, but the answer is so obvious that I'm just stated as the answer that I think Galileo was right about the Earth's motion. We wouldn't have gotten to the moon if we hadn't trusted Galileo and then Kepler and then Newton and then a host of other people that followed after that. Um, number three is back to the question, and in order to answer question three, you have to have questions one and two answered. Two's answered, so we're going to go into one very carefully. What lessons can we learn from what the scriptures say and what Galileo said about the Earth's movement from uh, about scriptural authority? With that, we will launch into the scriptures and basically take the arguments of the opponents of Galileo. Because Galileo is, is kind of arguing that this is an area where the Bible really wasn't concentrating on, um, then I think it's probably appropriate simply to look at the people who said, well, yes, the Bible does say something about it, and it says Galileo is wrong. The scripturally based arguments against the earth motion can be boiled down to three. Number one, scripture talks about the earth or the world, and um, to be fair, those uh, English words have um, Hebrew words behind them that uh, seem to be talking about basically the same kind of thing as we would, would talk about as not being moved. Number two, scripture speaks about the sun moving across the sky. And number three, Scripture speaks of the sun stopping its, uh, uh, stopping its motion and not the earth ceasing its rotation at the time of Joshua. Let's look at the texts that talk about the earth not being moved. There's several of them. Uh, fear, First Chronicles 16.30, Fear before him all the earth, the world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Um, 
Psalms 96.10, say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth, the world also shall be established that it should not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Psalms 104.5, who laid the foundation of the earth that it should not be removed forever. Now, for what it's worth, that removed is the same word that's translated moved in the other two texts. So, hmm, I don't know. My first reaction to that is that's kind of weak tea. It's poetic. In poetry, uh, all the trees clap their hands. Nobody believes that. I don't think people believed that back then either. Um, I'm a little cautious about reading something that's clearly marked poetry and trying to draw those kinds of conclusions. Um, the second is, how do we know that, that, that the Earth's movement in 24 hours is what's being referred to. If you look at the move, it, it kind of gets the idea of shaken, which of course is not constant rotation around an axis, which is the real controversy, really. Once you get the Earth moving around an axis, there's really no big problem with it moving around the sun. Well, it gets worse. There are several texts that talk about the earth moving. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the heaven moved and shook because he was wroth, which is an echo that's um, the same. Uh, apparently, uh, slight differences in transmission. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. Uh, First, uh, Second Samuel 22 and Psalm 18 are almost completely parallel. Not quite. We saw the word raka. Uh, you may remember that appeared in one but not the other. But it's, it's very close. They're obviously the same psalm with uh, somebody's different transcription. Uh, psalm 62, thou hast made the earth to tremble, thou hast broken it, the heal the breaches of it, for it shaketh. Uh, uh, Psalm 68, 8, the earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Sounds like there's a lot of movement of the earth going on. The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims, let the earth be moved. Isaiah 24, 19, the earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. Jeremiah 49, 21, the earth is moved at the noise of their fall. At the cry of the noise thereof was heard in the Red Sea. Jeremiah 50, 26, at the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved and the cry is heard among the nations. And you can say, well, that's just poetry, but well, isn't the other poetry? Psalm 46, 2, therefore we will not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Psalm 77, 18, the voice of thy thunder was heard in, he it was in the heaven, the lightnings lighted the world, the earth trembled and shook. Uh, Psalm 16, 8 is interesting in this regard because it's using the word moved in a little different way. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Does that mean that whoever wrote this psalm, presumably David, um, never moved after he wrote that psalm? If so, how did he eat? Um, obviously, we're not understanding moved in the right way if we say that it has to be stationary. So, <clears throat> um, I am not sure why the people who made that argument could make it with a straight face unless they really hadn't studied their Bibles very carefully. 
I don't think that the Latin translation would obscure this so much that you'd miss it that way. Now, a couple of other things that I ran into that are kind of interesting. Um, this is in Job 38, and this is God talking. So presumably this has probably secondary authority to um, the Ten Commandments and uh, maybe Genesis 1, because I happen to think that Genesis 1 was in fact God's description. But out outside of that, this is probably as authoritative as we get. Now, granted, it's poetic, so you have to be careful. And it's not totally clear. Maybe it was meant to be that way. Uh, Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the day spring to know his place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it? It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. Now, if you go back to those times, what you had was a clay that you could put a, a seal and roll stuff over on it. Almost sounding like maybe there's a hint that the earth, in fact, not only moves as in being shaken, but moves as in being turned like a seal. But again, you have to be careful. It is poetic and it's not clear what it is. And from the wicked their light is withholden and the high arms shall be broken. Um, so the next verse doesn't really help you out very much. Um, we have a question. Can you go back to the previous slide? I can. Uh, it is turned as clay to the seal. It sounds as though the clay is being turned, not the seal. That is true. That is true. But so pushed aside. Um, again, but the the clay is turned. This the seal is circular, but the clay is somehow you'd think it would be the turned seal that's turning over the clay, but it says that the clay is turned. Okay, um, let's look at it in a different translation. Verse 14, the earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. So there they've, they've completely turned, uh, taken out the turned the translation. I, uh, the part of why I'm pointing this out is because I don't think it's quite as clear from the Bible uh, which way you should look at it. Um, Isaiah 40, uh, have you not known, have you not heard, has it not been told you from the beginning, have you not understood from the foundations of the earth, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth almost sounding like it's a globe. The inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Again, this is uh, the, uh, the stretching out the heavens one that we've looked at uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, and then Job 26, he stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing, almost as if the earth is just kind of suspended in midair somehow. Um, now you keep on reading, and so he bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. Um, spread out the clouds hard as a molten mirror, I guess, so maybe so it can hold the water. He holdeth back the face of his throne, spreadeth his cloud upon it. He hath compassed the water with bounds until the day and night come to an end. And the pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. What are the pillars of heaven? Are they something that holds the heaven up? Or are they pillars that are in heaven? It's not clear. And you can see how with different uh, presuppositions, a different picture in mind, if you please, you can read the Bible and find what you want to in it 
where what you want to may or may not be what the original author intended. And um, then there's an interesting text too. He raiseth up the poor out of the dunghill, out of the dust, lifted up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. But I thought the world was set upon nothing. Um, why would you use that as an expression? Well, if that was an uneducated woman, maybe not so uneducated, but certainly um, that was Hannah, the mother of Samuel. Um, um, yes. This is this is uh, this kind of argumentation that is being used is virtually to the point of silliness. Today we talk about pillars of things and we do not think of columns. We think of some foundational concepts of our principles or, or issues on which everything else is based. We're not, I mean, we talk about people who are pillars of society. We don't think of them as having been turned to stone or anything. I mean, n nobody's that naive, surely. I think, though, to be fair, that the picture that is being conjured up is people, so, who, people who support the society I might even in, a, in, a, in a figurative way. Now, the, the point that I'm making is not so much that I can be, it would be really technical and say that, that uh, uh, in Job, by the way, the passage in Job 26 is from Job's mouth himself, that Job believed that the earth hung upon nothing, and we can be absolutely clear of that from the, from the poetry involved. Any more than I would say that the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and Hannah therefore believed that the earth was supported by pillars. Um, I sometimes wonder how seriously the ancient Greeks took the picture of Atlas holding the world on his shoulders. Um, I, I think that what we're reduced to doing is to peering into something where people, I think, in some ways didn't know and didn't care that much and were more interested in the pictures they, they uh, brought up and what those pictures had to say. And I think that if we're, if we're really looking at this, we want to, uh, what you see from Job is uh, God doesn't need uh, to have any supports for the earth. He can just put it there. It, it seems to me that these kinds of arguments that are being launched against to, well, I should say, to undermine the credibility of the biblical text. I mean, if they were applied to our day-to-day -day conversation, um, we, we would all end up being completely incomprehensible, uh, simply because such arguments do not seem to be designed for the purpose of either illuminating or coming up with some new insight. They seem to be just for the purpose of somehow undermining something. But they have no real weight in their own merit. Well, I guess what I'm, my, well, I, I will uh, anticipate my final conclusion on this particular end of it. Uh, so that is that I agree with uh, the, the uh, Cardinal and with Galileo that the Bible was not written to tell us how the heavens go. And that um, okay. you know if, if you want to you can peer into the, the distance and find stuff that fit your theory uh, but that it's probably not fair to put very much weight on it if any at all. Well, what I'm trying to say, I suppose, here is that I suspect that many of these details that we now argue over 
in, in some measure of silliness is because we do not really understand what the people of several thousand years ago knew and how they used their language. As I mentioned last week, we use sunset and sunrise and not a single person around today assumes that that means that uh, the earth is still and the sun moves around the earth. Yet we use the language in a way that seems to be most useful to us. And what that means is that if you look at the language, you can't make assumptions. Exactly. Because there was a day when those things were taken quite literally. Well, there I'm is a day now when they are not taken literally at all, um, except in a relative sense. And that, and that if you were to take a snapshot of our conversation now and compare it with a snapshot of the conversation before Copernicus launched his theory, that you'd be hard pressed to find significant differences between the two. Other than that every once in a while when we go to discussing, we talk about the earth and its yearly circuit around the sun or something like that. Um, which we don't do very often, and if we don't get into the details, uh, you'd never know. Uh, and, 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 and there comes a point where I think that it's better to say we just don't know, and that maybe there's a defect and maybe there isn't, and, and the best thing for us to do is just not draw too many conclusions based on whether there's a defect in somebody's knowledge or not. I think it's a mistake for us to extrapolate from what was thought about during the Dark Ages and assume that all the ancients knew as much or less. Well, because we know that all the ancients. The Dark Ages were dark for a reason. Well, we know that the, um, that the ancients knew uh, or believed differently in some cases because they told us. Uh, the Pythagoreans, in fact, did believe that the earth went around the sun. Um, the followers of Plato and Aristotle did not, and that's pretty clear. Ptolemy is very clear on exactly how the, uh, uh, how the earth was the center and the sun went around it and the moon went around it, which we all agree with, uh, sort of. Uh, and then the planets went around it as well. And they had strange movements at the opposite side from the sun all the time, and nobody could really explain how that worked, but, uh, but it's pretty clear that Ptolemy's um, theory is, is pretty well documented. Um, the problem that we run into is if you pick a random person out of the street, let's say in Greece at the time of Christ, and you ask them, what do you believe? And they just move on and don't tell you. So you try to find out from their writings whether they believe the Pythagoreans or whether they believe the Aristotelians. You'd have a hard time figuring it out. And I think, I think this, is, this is part of the problem of trying to peer back and ask what people knew back then. You can find little hints here or there. They're not very reliable hints. The fact of the matter is we just don't know. Um, now to get to the second argument, which is um, perhaps a little more straightforward. Psalm 19, their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world and them he has said it. This is talking about the heavens that declare the glory of God um, and the firmament that showeth his handiwork. Um, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race and he's going to run a race all the way across the sky. His going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends thereof and there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. And right here in this text, 
you can tell that this is poetic and they're, they're um, shall we say, exaggerating slightly. Because there are ice caves where the ice is, in fact, hidden from the heat of the sun. Um, some of them in places like Romania. Um, and uh, people who lived partly in houses constructed above ground, but partly also uh, occasionally in caves. Uh, and there's plenty of places in Palestine where you can do that. Um, no good and well that it's kind of nice to be in a cave at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, there, there are things that, in fact, are hid from the heat of the sun. But, you know, it's poetic. So don't take it too literally. But still, you have the picture of the sun starting out on one side and running across the sky. Um, if you want to say moving across the sky. Um, again, this suffers from the same problem. Uh, it would be nice for somebody to say, um, and the earth doesn't move, and then you'd feel secure. Um, but if the question doesn't come up, uh, or at least the answer doesn't come up, you don't really know for sure what's going on. Um, and then there's the story of Joshua. Now Joshua, this is the story of the five kings with Adonai Zedek, uh, king of Jerusalem, at the head of an army with five kings. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly and went up uh, from Gilgal all night. He surprised and attacked him, basically. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a the great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Ben Horon and smote them to Azekah and unto Mechidah. And this is interesting because of the way it's phrased. The Lord discomfited them uh, before Israel and the Lord slew them with a the great slaughter. You'd think it's the, the Israelite army that did this, but um, no. Because as it keeps on going, this is a very unusual day. And it came to pass as they fled before Israel and were, going in the, and were in the going down to Beth Horon that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Ezekah, and they died. There were more which died with the hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. And uh, must have been remarkable that the children of Israel somehow escaped the stones. Um, but this is clearly God acting, and this is not. The children of Israel were left with no doubt as to why this battle was won. It wasn't because they sprung a surprise attack. And then we get to one of the more famous passages in scripture, certainly in this regard, the most famous passage, I think. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said, in the sight of Israel, he must have known something, because nobody in his right mind would do this unless he was told, go ahead and say it, and I'll back you up. Sun, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? You, know, you can see the guy who's writing this saying, no, really, it happened. Uh, this is the first footnote in the entire history of, of uh, writing, as far as I know. You can check it out in the book of Jasher. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And uh, again, the guy who's writing this is just totally amazed by what happened. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened to the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. And then it finishes and Joshua returned and all of us were with him to the camp at Gilgal and, and goes on with the, the account. But here is, uh, there's a couple of things that you want to pay attention. One, Joshua commands the sun. Two, Joshua commands the moon. 
Why bother with the moon? If this is the Earth's rotation, once you stop the Earth's rotation, the sun and the moon are just fine. They'll, the moon will take care of itself if the sun does. And then, just to kind of push the point further, you'll notice that the writer, whoever he was, maybe it was Joshua, maybe it was some guy who was doing a scribe duty for Joshua, maybe it was somebody from a little later who was doing, was summarizing the, the story, but somebody wrote, and the sun stood still, and the moon stayed. I'm pretty clear that this is intended to be a historical reference. In fact, it's intended to be a historical reference of a very unusual event calling forth somebody saying, look, if you don't believe me, look in the book of Jasher. Which, by the way, I think is the book of truth, which is interesting in and of itself. But, so the sun stood still and hasted not to go down for a whole day. Now, I don't have a problem with this. Um, I suspect that Joshua was totally uninterested in whether the sun moved or the earth moved. He just wanted daylight and he didn't really care how he got it. But the implication seems to be, if you're being totally fair with the text, that whoever wrote this thought, and that Joshua also thought, that what needed to happen was the sun stopped. Well, if we were thinking in our terms, we would say the earth needs to stop rotating. Um, now there's a little tiny piece of this that's interesting, and that is that uh, one of the things that got Emanuel Velikovsky off to a fast start on what he was doing was that he found that at about this time, um, in some areas of the world there was a prolonged morning, in some areas of the world there was a prolonged night and that it actually made sense according to what was happening here in uh, Israel. In one case, I think there was a prolonged evening. I believe that's in, in China, uh, which suggests that, in fact, the sun did stop rotating, or the earth did stop rotating, or something happened that made this global anyway. And in our picture, we kind of have difficulty creating any other kind of uh, answer to this, then that the Earth stopped its rotation. And uh, we already have indications of miracles where God is sending down stones from heaven, but just not random stones. They're stones that are hitting the people that are fighting against the Israelites. Almost like he's got out the divine art artillery. You know? And uh, when you've got superior artillery, as Napoleon can tell you, you're going to win the war. <laughs> um, and so this is a day that God has intervened in a number of dramatic ways, and apparently a day that he intervened that showed up worldwide. The, the place where, uh, interestingly, Velikovsky couldn't find any anything uh, like it was uh, in Egypt, and that's one of the reasons that he started thinking, well, maybe there's something wrong in Egypt. Um, but uh, to go beyond that, uh, this passage uh, seems to indicate that at least Joshua and the person that wrote this operated from an Earth-centered perspective and had no uh, and had no clue that the, the sun and the moon weren't going independently of each other. Now, again, what Joshua said is poetry, but what this guy, rec whoever recorded it, that was prose. That was the standard way of writing things. Now, 
If I'm trying to summarize the arguments against Galileo, I think the earth not being moved is an absolutely pitiful argument. Only a few texts, a lot more texts that say it can be moved. Come on, folks, let's give that one up. The sun moving is a fair argument, but I don't think that it proves anything without uh, a little more detail. Uh, it's only powerful if one cannot tr find traces of the idea that the earth moves. I think the, um, the, uh, the text in Job about the clay seals does give me pause. Uh, but Joshua is commanding the sun to stand still. It's, I think, the best argument for a biblical writer's belief in a stationary earth. And I think it is, in fact, a pretty good one. And I think that we need to look at that and ask ourselves, well, supposing that's true, where do we go from there? And my own take on this is that probably some of the Bible writers were sophisticated. Perhaps Job was one of the better ones. Others were less so. I think that the hang of the earth on nothing is impressive, but I think that you still have to account for Hannah and her pillars. Um, but if you think about that, I don't think that destroys the authority of the Bible, and the reason why is very simple. If we require inerrancy in all matters in the Bible, then we have a very fragile uh, uh, case to make. But if inspired prophets were not necessarily inerrant, you see, uh, did God prevent everything that was written from having any trace? Well, no. I mean, it seems like uh, certainly the straightforward reading of the Joshua story uh, the uh, ability for us to understand scripture without having to strain it, I think, does kind of leave us with a Joshua being, you know, probably he didn't understand that, nor did the writer. But inspired prophets aren't necessarily inerrant, and the most important one has to do with theology itself. When John the Baptist preached. He preached a message that God gave him, but he didn't understand the message completely. If you had come to him quietly and said, well, what do you expect the Messiah to be like? Well, he's going to clean house. Well, that's what he said in, in public. But you know, Jesus didn't do that, and John, and John the Baptist came back with, did I make a mistake? Did, you know, it's, are, you, are you the right guy or, did, or did it, is there somebody else out there that, that I should be uh, pointing people to? And of course, Jesus says, well, you know, rather than argue with him, yes, I'm the right guy. He just said, take a look at what you see in here and tell, tell John what you saw in here and uh, go from there. Um, but John the Baptist didn't have his theology straight. It's that simple. And yet God used him. And the point of it is you don't have to have your theology totally 100% straight. Hey, well, Ellen White got her first vision. Did she believe in the Sabbath or not? If you'd asked Ellen White for a, a Bible study on uh, which day one should worship on, what would she have told you? Okay. So we need to give up this idea that everything that anybody who ever wrote that was inspired thought was in fact perfect, because it's not. We're all developing. The only one that you could make that claim even partially on would be Jesus. And even then, I have my doubts that when Jesus said his first word, he was ready to uh, lead Israel. He had to grow in his own knowledge according to Luke, and, and to the point where he was ready for his mission. So uh, even Jesus, where you can at least claim that he didn't have any defects, he certainly didn't have all the knowledge that he, that he had uh, at the end. He grew in wisdom. That means that he started out with less wisdom than he finished with. And if Jesus can do that, uh, you better believe it that us sinful humans can do that. So if you allow the Bible 
writers to not really totally understand everything, then you don't go back to them for this kind of information because it's not pertinent. It's not what God wanted us to understand. On the other hand, I think that the Bible is an authority where it intends to be one. And the Bible's writers, in fact, didn't care how the heavens go, but they did care how to go to heaven. But they did care a lot about theology. And enough of the outlines of theology are there to where you can figure things out. And they did care also about history. And this is a big mistake that people make, that in fact, Genesis 1 is history. It's not science. It is in particular making the point that Genesis history is not scientific. You and I cannot go out and repeat the experiment of God by saying, let there be light and have light come forth. We cannot say, let plants spring from the ground and have that happen on our own. We're not good enough. And so this is not reproducible. It is not science. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. That in fact, Genesis 1 does not have to be scientific to be authoritative. It's historical. And in fact, from the perspective of Genesis 1, science is intruding where it doesn't belong. That science is saying that everything has to be reproducible. And God says, I don't need any laboratory. And in fact, if you try to do this in the laboratory, you're going to fail. At that, I think I will leave uh, the matter for open discussion. Uh, we have uh, several people. We have one behind you there. Uh, who's, I think he had his hand up first, but you'll get second. Okay. I was going to say, um, as was mentioned earlier, just because he said sun stands still has no bearing whatsoever on how he thought it might stand still. I don't think he thought that the earth moved or the sun moved. It's just, you know, sun, stand still. It has nothing to do with what he really believed cosmically happened. Mm -hmm. It's just an, of, an expression of what he wanted to happen. How it happened, he didn't care. And it didn't have anything to do with what he believed really was happening. But if you had nudged Joshua, do you think that he would have given you an intelligent Copernican perspective on how the sun and the moon and the earth and the planets are? You know, it matters zilch. The, I didn't say it matters zilch. I, I said, what, do you think he could have given you a, a Copernican perspective? I don't have any idea. I don't know what he okay. knew because if they were created then, in the image then of God, then they may well have known. In this discussion, I think it's better for us to say, you know what, probably he wouldn't have given you a Copernican perspective and make the point that it doesn't matter, rather than trying to insist that all of these people had their science precisely right. Yeah, I agree, but, yeah, but just because he said stand, sun stands still, and that's the way it's recorded, is, has nothing to do with what we can believe he understood or what the Bible says is just an expression of what he wanted to happen. Yeah. We can't make a scientific point on it, a theological point on it. It, it has nothing to do with that at all. If I'm, if I'm peering through the mist, though, I, I say, and why bother with the moon then? So I would rather say, you know, he probably did have make a mistake, but it doesn't matter than to try to say, you know, there were no mistakes in the Bible of any kind, including this one. Be, uh, remember this, too, is that if you use that hermeneutic, you have to use it everywhere. And this is, the, this is the, the other key that I was trying to make a point on, is that if you start saying that, well, what's being said obviously isn't, isn't what really is meant, then at a certain point, people are going to start using that on you. Well, the days really didn't mean what they obviously meant, you know. And I would rather say the Bible isn't pretending to be a scientific authority. Uh, there are mistakes, probably. If you want to push me and say, well, did it have to happen? The fact of the matter is I don't know. And let's just be honest, I don't know. But maybe you're right. 
and it doesn't matter. I, I think you're better off defending it that way than trying to defend it by saying, well, no, the Bible really didn't make a mistake there. Um, we have a couple of comments here, so when you're if, done. If the strongest argument about the movement of celestial bodies is Joshua's uh, command to sun and moon, uh, then I think it's a fairly shoddy argument and we have nothing to fear. Uh, and one of the reasons that comes to my mind is very simple. First of all, Joshua was not interested in doing a dissertation on the astronomical motions of various bodies. He was in the heat of the battle. All he was concerned about is making a day longer so that he can yeah. finish the battle. My, my, my reaction to that is, if you were to say to Joshua, don't you mean Earth stop rotating? You'd probably got the butt end of a spear out of it. It'd seem like, <laughs> get out of my way. <laughs> you, know, you know, what are you, you know, and I was thinking, okay, so what would I say if I was in that situation? But I'd like that sun to remain in that spot and that moon to remain in that spot and that'll be good. Till the battle's done. What, I mean, you want a big philosophical uh, discussion on this now? Yeah. I don't think, and that's in spite of everything I know now. That's still the most sensible thing to say. So if that's the case, what logical, what possible reasons could we have to come up with arguing Oh, they didn't understand how things really moved. Yeah, that, that is so, it, it's like, oh, we are the greatest. We know everything. They knew nothing. That is very bad vantage point to work from for anyone who launches such arguments. So I'm sorry, but... I have never seen uh, this story of Joshua and come away with the argument that sun moved around the earth as the result of that story. The translation. And I've read it since I was, uh, since yeah. I started reading. The translation of that story into either a geocentric or a heliocentric universe is so obvious and so close to whatever that I agree with you. I don't think. And I think that when Andrew Dixon White tried to say, well, the, the, uh, the uh, Protestants just said some things about the, the Bible wasn't talking about that. Well, of course they did, because that's right. And, uh, and uh, you know, the Bible wasn't intended to tell us that. So if it doesn't tell us that, what's the big deal? Uh, but I think it was intended to tell a historical story. And I would put it this way. I would be profoundly disturbed if I were to find that there was some kind of a historical record that went clear through the time of Joshua and never, uh, say from a Canaanite city, and never mentioned that the Israelites invaded uh, uh, Canaan and never mentioned that there was a long day, and never mentioned that there were hailstones, um, and uh, when they should have known. That would bother me a great deal. Something is wrong here. Um, although, interestingly enough, when a conflict exactly like this came up between Sargon's monuments in his palace, and the scriptural account of the king of Assyria that captured uh, Israel. The monuments were the ones found to be lying. So it's a, it's a dangerous bet to, get, uh, to bet against the Bible in that kind of situation. We have this, uh, how should I say, tendency to wish to revise history so that it would agree with our current prejudices. And that is a dangerous thing to do always.
Uh, just a, a little sidelight on this issue. Uh, geologically speaking, should you stop the rotation of the Earth, this would be absolutely catastrophic. catastrophic. Now you say, well, okay, God did it. Uh, we can say that. Uh, it seems to me it's so much easier to bend light rays than to stop the Earth. Uh, Velikovsky, to the uh, contrary, maybe, uh, you can find folk literature stories about most anything you want to, if you look hard enough, uh, and so on. Uh, and maybe the moon got caught up in the same issue, but uh, uh, I just wonder if we need to be cautious about what mechanism was involved here in this. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're rotating, you know, at a thousand miles per hour, and you're going to stop this. Uh, you're, you're going to have real interesting uh, geological changes. Yes. Well, if, you're going to, if, if all you're going to do is stop the core of the Earth from rotating. Um, but I think that, uh, I think that part, of, part of the point is that, that God has the ability to do this kind of thing where we, d we actually don't. And if we tried, we'd have oceans starting to slosh off onto the land on one side and slosh back on the other side and all kinds of things. Uh, we'd have 1,000-mile-an-hour winds at the equator and a few things like that that we don't have. He took care of those details. I, I should point out, it's just past 11.30, and so I know some of you have other places to go. And I think we're about ready to, to finish anyway, but we'll see. I don't think the issue for Galileo and the church had anything to do with the is scientific issues. It, it was a political entity that used Christianity to maintain its political position, and it did so like all entities, the reason monuments are built and all kinds of power structures are done so that the people in authority can maintain that. There's different things that they do, whether it's building big monuments and cities or whatever they do to maintain their own position. The authority of the church, it had to be right in order to maintain its political position. And it was just an issue. They had made a mistake and they had to try and back their mistake in order to maintain their political power. And it's not an issue of Christianity, nor the authority of God, nor the rotation of the earth. It's a political issue regarding maintaining power. I would have to agree with that, and I think that, um, uh, that in fact, one of the evidences of this is the earth shall never be moved is just totally indefensible from the scriptures alone. You would never use that argument unless you were willing to use defective arguments to support your position, which says that people were using the scripture not to trying to understand it, but were using it to support their preconceived opinions. I think that's pretty clear. Well, the history of the church uh, throughout that time period and the number of people killed by papal armies doesn't lend itself well to Christianity as we know it well. It's obviously a political entity. I agree. And I, I think that's actually a lesson to us too is we have to be very careful not to use uh, papal uh, ways of dealing with things. Either authority from the top down instead of authority from the evidence uh, I, I do believe in the priesthood of all believers, and that means that nobody has a right to tell anybody else what they have to believe. Um, uh, and this, you know, it, it needs to be persuasion, and the, if it's not persuasive enough, give them time. It doesn't necessarily mean you give them your kids to teach as well, but uh, at least, you know, you have to, you have to be... Uh, you have to treat them with the respect that you would expect to have. And the second thing is that, that I think we need to be really careful about uh, using uh, coercion to change people's minds. If you don't do this, I'll fire you. Uh, we're going to get control over the, over the situation, and then we're going to clean house. We're going to have what the Lord really wants us to do. Um, because 
you know, that's, Jesus said something that, that's too easy for us to forget. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight? But in the practicality of having institutions, you don't work for Disney and dress t tattooed and smoke out there in your outfit. There is a there is a right for an institution that ad adheres to certain things to ask people that uh, are employed by that institution to respect those things in order to be part of that. They don't have to change, but they don't have to be part of yeah. the, what's represented to the public as them. No, and I and I agree with that too. Um, I think we we need to be careful as to how we go about that. And I think one of the things that we really need is to is to have a little more dialogue. Uh, because I think that the truth will stand out in clearer shape uh, in that process. Uh, one more. Um, my question has to do with uh, Galileo and, and the authority of the church at the beginning of Galileo and the church in that um, a good chunk of people there at that point in time had to have sincerely believed that the earth wasn't moving and otherwise they would have never made the mistake and pushed it so far no matter what the authority they wanted to back it up with they wouldn't have gone down that road if they knew where that road went they uh, would I have think said, you're right I think if they had looked down the road and said you know in a, a hundred years this is going to look so stupid uh, that that none of them would have gone down the road, and they would have they would have found ways to back around it. Um, I they didn't know that they were wrong. Right, but going through all the the text that you've shown today, you know it shows many that the Earth moved, and, and a few that maybe it doesn't. And Joshua is pretty much the only really clear type of thing. Is that all that they were hanging their their hat on? What what else did they or is it just their own day-to-day -day understanding of, of their situation? You know, that's the interesting thing. If you look at, uh, Joshua did not form the most prominent part of their argument, even though I think that's the strongest text. The most prominent part of their argument was that the earth doesn't move because the Bible says the earth doesn't move. And, you know, I just, I started going through the Bible and seeing, well, you know, earth earth and move and, and uh, world and move and, and you, <laughs> you get way more texts to say it moves than, uh, than to say it doesn't. Are those, in those texts where it's saying it, it does move or stuff, is there a difference in the Hebrew language between motion and uh, like earthquake, you know, shaking, like that kind of movement? Is there differences in, in the movement? Uh, not as far as we can tell. The, uh, the movement that is being talked about, that the earth will never be moved, um, is, is the same word that says the earth moved. And both of them seem to be most easily interpreted by saying that it's talking about to and fro movement and movement of mountains and stuff like that. Um, whether there's you know, a solid ball that just sits there in space doesn't seem to be addressed at all. So it's... It's a bad argument, uh, both because you can find texts that, that disagree with it, and also because the, the movement doesn't appear to be the kind of movement we're talking about anyway. And to look at that movement, I shall not be moved, so I'm standing still as a stone, I don't think so. It's that I don't move when, where I don't want to, and so there's no reason for the earth not to be turning in a nice, uh, you know, circular motion and then, and, and that motion just keeps on going and, and nothing moves it relative to that motion. There's nothing that really stops that from happening or that the earth is hurtling through space around the sun and the sun is sitting in this dead center and, uh, but nothing changes the relative motion so that 
in terms of how you feel, it feels solid. On the other hand, you know, you could take those texts as saying, well, the, sun did, uh, the earth didn't really stop its rotation at the time of Joshua. But the one is serious prose <laughs> with a reference, and the other one is poetry. Um, you know, God's going to be with me forever. Well, you're going to die? I'll praise God forever. And you can find those expressions. Obviously, forever is to be taken in a kind of a poetic sense where it's not absolute. And one of those other texts had it, you know, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, but it's, the, the poetry is obviously, uh, you know, constraining us as far as what, how we understand the literal text. In reading a Catholic author, and I don't want to repeat what I may have missed before, but a Catholic author describing the Galileo incident, his description was there were many of the people that believed, agreed with Galileo, and there were those that didn't, but it was a, it was not a uniform belief of the church that Galileo was not right, but that Galileo, in choosing to have a, a figure that was obviously the Pope in his book, with the title Simpleton, didn't really work well in that politics. And that that caused probably about as much problem for him as anything. If you refer to your president as a simpleton in a book right now, he's probably not going to get your greatest favor from you. Um, no, I agree. In fact, I remember fairly recently a, uh, an accidentally recorded conversation where uh, certain GC figures, or, or not GC, um, I guess North American division figures, were referred to in somewhat similarly unflattering terms. And, uh, and uh, that uh, incident caused the um, resignation of a few people in one of our institutions. Uh, it's, we can have different visions of the future even in a certain sense, but when you start calling the person that's running the show an idiot, why, it's not terribly surprising that the, that person will react. Anyway, at that, I will leave it and we'll try to maybe come back another day and talk about uh, what uh, what we should not learn from Galileo. <laughs>